days of the law that was given to Moses 1300 years before for Christ. And there, it's very common for him to say, you will have heard that, then go on to say, but I tell you. So he's interpreting the law, and that's what they will uh, be doing for us this morning. Uh, I like to think that Christ is turning, uh, teaching us uh, the ABCs of how we should live as Christians, as members of his kingdom. The ABCs are what our attitudes should be, what our behaviors should be, and what our characteristics should be as children of God and, and living members of his church here. So we look forward to, to that this morning, Dave. So let, let's start with the prayer and just take a moment just to breathe quietly as we invite the Holy Spirit to be with us in this service, to occupy our hearts, our minds, may hear the words that he would have us hear this morning as we seek to be true members of his kingdom here on earth. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day that you've given us, for this blessed sunshine and warmth. So as we gather we gather to praise you with our hearts, with our voices, that we rededicate our lives to you this morning. Thank you for all the blessings, for the music that we shall sing. Thank you for the words that you will give day for us to hear and digest. And we thank you for the children that are gathered here this morning, for these are the future children of your kingdom here on earth. We give you thanks, we praise you, Lord, and we love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 We've got some songs to start off, but we're going to start with an all-age song. That means all of us. Okay, we can we get us to um, copy God.
our young people are going to be leaving now for their groups, but I thought we could just pray for them and for other young people in the valley. Let's just be still for a moment and think of some of the children we see around in this building, in the roads around, maybe where we live as well. And if we give thanks for young people and children for what they teach us how they're blessing to us. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would be upon them this day and evermore. Amen. Amen. Okay, so the young people are going to leave for their group and we're going to sing in just a moment. What a powerful name 
Corner seven. Corner of a short prayer. So what God's like compared with a temporary, compared with the stuff which, which grabs our attention in the media. What is God like? What is Jesus like? In you we find truth, same yesterday, today, and forever. And is to 
adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the oaths you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Let's pray as we think about these challenging words. Lord, thank you for your presence here. Thank you for the lantern, for this community. We pray that through your word, you would speak to us this morning, that our hearts might be changed, and that we might become more like you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 <clears throat> there are two types of family walk. The first is where the parents say, I know, let's go for a walk. And the children go, Mummy and Daddy, what a brilliant idea. Yes, let's go. They skip out of the house. They go on the walk. And throughout the walk, you just have wonderful conversations. You notice all kinds of beauty in the natural world around you. All is harmony and peace. And you return to the house. And everyone goes, wasn't that wonderful? With hearts overflowing. There is another kind of family walk. Where the parents say, I know, let's go for a walk. And the children go, what, why, no, we don't, walks are so boring, we don't want to go. 45 minutes later, the front door closes, having taken all that time to get shoes and coats together. And you go on a walk, oh, do we have to go any further? Can't we turn around? My legs are hurting. Have you bought any chocolate? Will you carry me? You get the picture. You return to the house. And the parents go, oh, why did we even bother? And the children over here would go, what? Why are you complaining? We came on your, on your walk, didn't we? Isn't that what you wanted? I'm sure none of you have experienced the second kind of walk, but having um, endured lots of them. I, I was reminded of them, reading the Sermon on the Mount again this week. 
Because the Sermon on the Mount is, I think, about the difference between those two walks. The Sermon on the Mount is the difference between Christians whose hearts are in it, who love the Christian journey and love being with God and want to be with their Christian family and return from times together with hearts overflowing. That kind of Christian life on the one hand. On the other hand, people are like, yeah, I've been to church. God, isn't that what you wanted me to do? I volunteered to do the washing up. Isn't that what you want? I even gave some of my money to the church. Aren't you happy now? And if we're honest, sometimes as children, I don't know about you, speak for myself, I can come into either camp. The Sermon on the Mount is about the fact that God's interested in our hearts. Not just in us doing what we ought to do. You could argue, we haven't got time now, but you could say that's more of an Old Testament view of the outward observance of laws. Whereas God is more interested in the kind of family walk where people's hearts are in it. And that we come back from times together with hearts overflowing, full of joy. In the Old Testament, when the prophet Samuel is um, looking for David, who's going to be anointed as a king, um, God speaks to him some words that have been hugely influential in, in my life, actually. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Mm. I think it's so hard for us to really understand, to take those words to heart. Because we live our whole lives on outward appearance, don't we? What we look like, what we wear, what phone we have, what house we live in, what car we drive. Our whole life is predicated on judgment of outward appearance. But when we come to God, he looks straight through all of that and he looks straight into our hearts. And that's all that matters to him. I don't want to break it to you, but God doesn't mind what you put on in the morning. God doesn't care what car you drive, what phone you have, what, what your house looks like. God is looking at our hearts. And that could be either very comforting or very scary, depending on what kind of mood you're in. And so the Sermon on the Mount is about a vision for a new kind of life together, where we live according to our hearts, not according to outward appearance. And today's passage focuses on three quite practical but very important parts of community life together. The first bit is about lust, which is about looking and wanting. It's about not having but wanting to have. And um, Jesus quotes the Ten Commandments several times in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and the last of the Ten Commandments, the Tenth Commandment, deals um, with this lust on quite a broad range. We're told there not to covet our neighbour's house or, or our neighbour's wife or our neighbour's servant or our neighbour's ox or our neighbour's donkey. Now, I don't know how do you do with that list. Probably, probably all of us would say, I'm, I've never coveted my neighbour's ox. <laughs> but can any of us say we've never coveted anything that belongs to someone else. One of my sons came home the other day, we just got a new toaster. Came home the other day, he was like, oh, my friend's toaster. It's amazing, we've got to get one of those. It does like bagels and waffles. And I was like, well, what's wrong with our toaster? He's like, no, you should have seen it, it's amazing. Almost makes me want to go and see it. How can a toaster be amazing? <laughs> I didn't get to it. But we live in this consumerist world, don't we, where we are absolutely encouraged as a virtue, as a lifestyle, to look at things we don't have and want them. Now, at one level, you think, well, that's kind of consumerism. It's relatively harmless. We're all prone to it. At another level, what's that doing to our hearts? It's training us to be uncontent. That's a word, incontent, with what we have. It's, it's training us to want things that aren't ours. It's training us we can't be happy or fulfilled or even whole as people unless we have something that we haven't been given. And perhaps nowhere is this more um, destructive of community than when it's people who are involved. And so Jesus wants to go to the heart. 
You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Maybe some, but I'm sure not all of the people listening were like, oh, that's all right, I've kept that one. He goes on, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And of course, he could equally have said anyone who looks at a man lustfully has already committed adultery with her, with him in her heart. He's saying, I can see into your hearts. And when you want someone or something that isn't yours, in your heart, something's already gone badly wrong. Nowadays, it's as likely, much more likely to be in the online environment than it is in, in real life. But either way, I think Jesus is wanting to say, something's gone wrong in your heart. If you look at someone who is not yours and you want them, or you want to treat them as an object rather than a person, whether it's your neighbor's ox or their toaster <coughs> or their wife, heart problem is still the same. And Jesus' advice is pretty radical. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gag your hand and throw it away. Graham was here at the morning service and said, does that apply to me as well? <laughs> well, he's not taking it literally. And it would be easy to identify Christians, wouldn't it, if we had to remove the body part that caused us to sin. We'd all sort of be limping around. Well, I would anyway, completely dismembered. No, even though there were occasional people in the first centuries who took this literally, um, this isn't literal advice. The advice is do not compromise with sin. Do not compromise. Cut these things out of your life. Well, how do we do that? It's easier said than done. I've got a little um, illustration that I would like to, uh, to, um, to illustrate this. So I need a volunteer to help me. You sat Only got yourself to play. <laughs> Pop the bowl for a second. You're not going to get injured or wet or anything. Okay. I have spent quite a lot of my life wrestling with this issue of, of the heart. And here's some advice that I've been given that I've found quite helpful. So imagine this is my heart. Yeah? It's, uh, it's not completely full of muck, but there's a lot in there. That's just an average day. <laughs> okay? Now... How do I stop more of this muck, of this film, getting into my heart? Well, how do you? It's a rhetorical question you don't have to answer. I think this is our instinct, is I'm going to find a lid and I'm going to stop myself thinking about any of those things so that nothing more can get in. Have you ever done that? Like, oh no, don't, don't think about that. Stop thinking about that. I shouldn't be thinking about that and we try and put a lid on it. The problem is, the lid in itself is already making us think more about that thing, isn't it? I mean, you know, if I say to you now, don't think about bananas. <laughs> you're all thinking about bananas. <laughs> if we say to ourselves, stop thinking about that, it's never gonna work. So throw away the idea that we can, by force of mind, change what we're thinking about. Here is, I think, some good advice. The first thing is that God will wash out our hearts. And if your heart's anything like mine, that's really good news because we can get a new heart any time we want by just going and asking God to clean our hearts out. And they are, well, more or less, clean when God does it. Completely clean. How do we then stop all of the dirt pouring back in again? Well, fill it with something else. Fill it so it's overflowing. What is the something else? Well, this isn't my advice, it's someone else's, but I think I found it very helpful. There are two things. The first is things we do. If we are struggling with covetous, lustful thoughts, with any thoughts that we don't want in our mind, we can occupy ourselves with things that benefit other people and not ourselves. Because at the root of this problem is our own selfishness. We want to change our own lives. We want to change our own hearts. How about helping someone else? Get involved in something else. And every single one of you already does this. But I have found it's really helpful at times when you're being tempted, when you're wrestling with your own thought life. Just be practical. Get involved in something else. 
and it fills your mind with other people's lives and other people's problems, which is quite a relief from just suffering with our own. The other thing we can do is fill our minds with other thoughts. And this is why Vickers bang on and on about reading the Bible. Because we can fill our minds so they overflow with goodness. You know, computer programmers always say, garbage in, <coughs> garbage out. It's the same with our minds. And the more goodness we pour into our minds, the more they will be full of goodness. So reading the Bible is the classic discipline of the Christian life, but there are infinite other numbers, um, other varieties. One thing I love doing is watching natural history programs on TV. Now there are lots of things that I can watch on a screen that are very, very bad for my spiritual life. But personally I find watching things that awaken awe, that make me wonder at the beauty of the world, that, that stay with me for the whole week, are just so good for my mental health as well as my spiritual health. So, thank you, Mike. Um, that's just some practical, I want to be practical, rather than just stand here and say, do not lust, do not covet. I think that making sure we are actively growing habits that fill our lives with goodness and fill our minds with good things is one of the ways we can become the kind of people we really want to be kind of people God wants us to be. And it changes our hearts, especially as we practice those habits over a lifetime. So at the heart of the Sermon on the Mount is a God who wants us to be wholehearted, not to have dark secrets that linger there and never flushed away, but to be constantly renewed, as St Paul says, and transformed by the renewing of our minds. And what goes for adultery also, and lust, also goes with divorce. In Jesus' day, divorce had become something that was purely a paper formality for men. They could write, I divorce you, and hand it to their wife in front of two witnesses, and they were divorced, and that was it. And it was horrific, and you can imagine the impact on women. I mean, one rabbi writes about a man who divorced his wife for burning some food. It was that the, the idea of the heart of marriage had been completely lost in this cruel and vicious, awful practice that divorce had become. And so Jesus raises the bar. And uh, this isn't a whole talk on divorce. Um, I wish there was time. Um, unfortunately, the people at the 930 service got quite a lot on, on this section, but I'm going to speak a lot shorter today. But if anyone wants um, to discuss more the actual New Testament teaching, on divorce, which is, is mainly found here in Matthew 5, also in Matthew 19, and 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I would sum it up with just three points. Marriage is good for those who are called to it and is intended to be lifelong. That's a clear teaching of the Bible. Divorce is painful, but sadly sometimes necessary. That is also a teaching of the New Testament. And God is kind and offers forgiveness and a second chance. I think that is also important to hold up. Sometimes you hear the church talking about divorce as if, you know, well, if, you, if you've been a mass murderer or you've been in prison for 20 years, come to church, there's another chance. But if you've been divorced, well, I'm afraid, you know, one strike and you're out. And all the different denominations have their different ways of trying to express those three truths. That marriage is good and, and everyone who enters into marriage that I've ever known wants it to last for a lifetime, but sadly, in our fallen world, it doesn't always last, and divorce is necessary. But God is kind and tender-hearted, especially to those who've had their hearts broken. And then finally, there's the same theme about our hearts, is um, hearing that oaths, we don't use the word oath very much, do we? But it's really just about saying what you mean, telling the truth. Um, our country is going through a cost of living crisis at the moment, but I believe it's also going through a cost of lying crisis. There's an absolute crisis of truth in the Western world where you just don't know if people are saying the truth or not. It's not a new problem. In Jesus' day, people would, um, as they do now, often habitually lie. But if they wanted to convince people they really were telling the truth, they would take an oath and say, in God's name, this. But then um, everyone started doing that, so then some of them started saying, 
Um, if they weren't telling the truth, they would still say an oath to make people think they were, but they would take an oath um, by heaven, or by God's throne, or by Jerusalem, or in the, by the name of the hairs on my head, or they would swear on just about anything to try and convince people. But they would feel no, um, because they hadn't actually used God's name, they would feel no compulsion to actually tell the truth. If you can, it was a similar kind of mess that we're in now, if you ask me. And Jesus just wants to sweep all of this away. He says, do not swear. Do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair black or white, which is a shame, but true. He says, all you need to say is simply yes or no. And this comes back again, just to finish, at the heart of the issue. God wants us to be wholehearted in our <coughs> community. He wants the lantern to be full of people who are wholehearted. Who are not just saying, well, I, I think I've done what God wanted me to do. But who want to live with hearts that are open to God, full of truth, full of love being daily washed clean, being daily filled with goodness. In short, he wants us to be like he is, a God who never lies, who never uses anyone, who never treats people as objects. The vision for the lantern is a group of people who are in it with all their hearts. That is that a vision of people who are heartfelt in their love for one another. And I think that is what this community is. Duncan's wife, Isabel, was here at the morning service. It was so moving to see her surrounded with love. And to hear her talk about the love that you have poured out on her and others since Duncan died and while he was ill. This is the kind of community that we were made for and that you are building here in Marlow Bottom. It's what Jesus taught us about in the Sermon on the Mount. And by his spirit, he gives us power to live this way that's totally different to everyone else, to every other community, to be salt and light. And by his spirit, he will help us to keep building a community that um, shares his love, spreads his light throughout Marlow Bottom and beyond. Father, we confess that by nature we look to do just enough so often. By nature we, we have hearts that are, that are full of things that shouldn't be there. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, for your cleansing power, and for the vision you give us of living life a different way, your way. Send your spirit upon the lantern. Today we pray. May every member of this community catch a fresh vision for life with clean and pure hearts. Teach us to live like you, in love, in truth, thinking more of others than we do of ourselves. to open our hearts to you now as we take bread and wine together and to join together in building your church that it may be here in Marlow Bottom on the cities in heaven. Challenging words, but also words of grace. And um, it's a very strong picture of how our hearts can become clean. So maybe as we sing this about our hearts, maybe it's a, a song to ask God for his cleansing. <laughs>
Father, we hold before you the brokenness of relationships involving us, our families, our community. Well, may we know forgiveness, may we know hope to build. We know your restoration. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, we pray for couples we know who may be struggling. May things may appear on the outside good. Among the quiet, we just hold them before you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, we hold before you single people. We pray for your special touch to how you've called them. And how they can walk with you. Pray that we would be generous to welcome and include. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. And lastly, we pray for those in our community in need. We think of Isabel, of Adam, bring them your comfort. And in a moment of quiet, we just hold before you those we know who are unwell. Lord, 
will be your mask. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks to Him. It is always right to give you thanks, God our Creator, loving and faithful, holy and strong. You made us in the whole universe and filled your world with life. Praise to you, O Lord. You sent your Son to live among us, Jesus, our Saviour, Mary's child. He suffered on the cross. He died to save us from our sins. He rose in glory from the dead. Praise to you, O Lord. He sent your Spirit to bring you life to the world and clothe us with power from on high. And so we join the angels to celebrate and sing.
night before he died, Jesus shared a meal with his friends. He took the bread and thank you. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. After the meal, Jesus took the cup of wine. He thanked you and gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood, the new promise of God's unfailing love. Do this to remember me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ is now. Christ is now. Christ is Father, as we break this bread and wine, and remember his death and resurrection, send your Holy Spirit upon us, and we who share these gifts may be fed by Christ's body and his blood. Pour your spirit on us, that we may love one another, work for the healing of the earth, and share the good news of Jesus as we wait for his coming in glory. For honor, glory, and praise belong to you, Father, Son, Son and Holy Spirit. Bread to share in the body of Christ. That we are many, we are one body, because we will share in one bread. Most merciful Lord, your love compels us to come in. Our hands were unclean, our hearts were unprepared. We were not fit even to eat the crumbs from my meal table. For you, Lord, and the God of our salvation, and share your bread with sinners. So cleanse and feed us with the precious body and blood of your Son, that he may live in us and we in him, and that we, with the whole company of Christ, may sin and eat in your kingdom. that are purified, the spirits that are new life, renewed, and lives that are rededicated to Christ, we come to share the banquet he has prepared for us.
Son and the Holy Spirit, be with us now and remain with us always. Amen. 